So far, we've looked at two examples of conjugate analyses, the beta binomial and the gamma Poisson, right? So now I'm going to use the gamma Poisson example to talk about what happens to the posterior when you get some data, right? As I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the beta binomial case, the posterior is a compromise between the prior and the likelihood. I'm going to now really make this idea precise with an analytical example using the Poisson gamma case that I discussed in the previous lecture, okay? So continuing from the previous lecture, we know that we have a gamma prior, we have a Poisson likelihood, and we know how to derive the gamma posterior, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to express the posterior mean that is A star over B star. A star and B star are the updated parameters, right, for the posterior for lambda. Uh, I'm going to express the posterior mean as a weighted sum of the prior mean and the maximum likelihood estimate of lambda. Right? This is a fascinating analytical proof that gives you really good insight into what is going on when you're doing Bayesian data analysis, okay? So let's think about this, okay? So we have a posterior mean. The posterior mean can be uh, computed A star over B star, right? And we know what A star is. A star, as I derived last time, was A plus sum of X. And we know what B star is. B star is B plus N or N plus B, okay? So we can rewrite this term, right? as follows, right? So I've just, what I've done here is that I've simply rewritten equation one in exactly the same way. All I have changed is that instead of writing sum of x, I've written it as n times x bar. What is x bar? x bar is the mean, right, of from the data that we have. So this is a very common trick that we use in statistics, right? So if you have a sum of data points, right, if you have a sum of data points, you can always write this as the sum of data points divided by n and then multiplied by n again, right? So what is that? That's going to be n times x bar. This is a very, very common trick that one uses for uh, uh, changing the form of a, of a summation here, right? You'll see this again and again in statistics books. So anyway, I've just done this simple change here. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide both the numerator and the denominator by B. And let's see what that gives me, okay? So I've got A plus N X bar here. I divide the whole thing with B. And I've got N plus B, the whole thing divided by B. Okay, so I've divided B on both sides, so I still get the same term, right? Because I've divided both things by B, right? But what this gives me is something fascinating, right? If I unpack this bracket here, I will get A divided by B, that should sound familiar to you, plus, n x bar divided by b, and the denominator will be one plus n divided by b, okay? So where is this going? If you think about it, a over b is the mean of the prior distribution, right? So we can rewrite, instead of writing a over b, we're going to write m here. m is the mean of the prior, okay? And everything else is just the same as before. I haven't changed anything here. I just wrote them as fractions now, and I'm using, I've just written them so that you can see the commonalities now between the numerator and denominator. I've got an n over b term here and an n over b term here, but I haven't changed anything. I just rewrote it, right? So now we can rewrite this in, uh, in the following way, right? We will write this as, um, we'll break up the numerator, okay? Break up the numerator into two terms. The first term is the mean m, right? Divided by one plus n over b. And the second term is this one here, n over b, x bar divided by one plus uh, uh, n over b, right? So all I've done is I've just separated out the two numerators holding the denominators in place as before, right? Not much of a change. But what this gives us is something very interesting. Suppose I rewrite one as the weight w1 and rewrite uh, n over b as the weight w2, I can rewrite the equation now as a weighted sum. A weighted sum of what? the weighted sum of the mean of the prior and the maximum likelihood estimate, that is the sample mean, right? So what you're seeing is that the posterior mean, remember this was the posterior mean that we were computing, right? The posterior mean is a weighted sum of the prior mean and the maximum likelihood estimate. 
right? This is the graphical picture I showed you earlier, where the posterior lands somewhere between the likelihood and the prior. This is the analytical form of that in the Poisson gamma case, right? So the interesting thing to, thing to notice here is that as n approaches infinity, right? If n approaches infinity, what will happen? This term w2 will become larger and larger relative to w1, right? So w2 will dominate here, right? So if your sample size gets larger and larger, the posterior mean will be dominated by this w2 term. w1 will be almost non-existent now. So your posterior mean will look exactly like the frequentist maximum likelihood estimate, right? If you have a lot of data. If you have very little data, then this term will be small, n will be small, and then the posterior mean will be weighted towards the prior. So basically, the posterior mean is going to shift towards the likelihood if you have lots of data, and it's going to shift towards the prior if you have very little data. That is one of the very big, deep uh, advantages and insights, that, uh, advantages of Bayesian data analysis, and it's a deep insight that you should keep in mind whenever you're doing data analysis. When we look at concrete data analysis later on, you will see that this, this uh, tension between the prior and the likelihood is going to play out in very interesting and important ways. Okay? All right, so that's the, what I just said, you know, about the increasing n and increasing uh, and decreasing n, it will change your, uh, the posterior. So you can, uh, you will also notice that the variance of the posterior will also be affected by the sample size, right? So as n approaches infinity, the posterior variance will approach zero, right? That makes sense too. The posterior will get tighter and tighter and tighter as you get more and more data. So if you want a very tight posterior distribution for your parameter in order to make a very uh, certain inference, you know, about your problem that you're working on, and we will look at examples of that later, the solution is to get more data and to make sure that you get a tight posterior, right? So that's, that's a good example, analytical example that shows the relationship between the prior mean and the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, so it's time to step back now for a moment and think about what we have achieved, right? So now we have seen two examples of conjugate analysis using simple algebra. Algebra is even an exaggeration. I mean, I was literally doing addition and multiplication, right? There was really not much computation involved, right? So these simple cases, there are other cases like this. You can have the normal, normal conjugate case also, and there are many others, some others. But what's important for us is these two examples illustrate that the posterior mean, or the posterior in general, is going to be a compromise between the prior and the, and the likelihood. And um, when the data are sparse, we are going to go towards the prior when we look at the posterior distribution, we'll be getting closer and closer to the prior because we'll be dependent more on the prior than the actual data because there isn't any or almost no data. But when we have a lot of data, then the posterior distribution will reflect uh, the maximum likelihood estimate that we get from the data, right? So this is a very important insight here, right? So the, now this was all very interesting right, doing all these analyses on paper, but the reality of data analysis is that we often cannot work with such simple models. Of course, you have, if you have simple data, you can work with such simple analyses, but realistic data analyses takes us far beyond these conjugate cases. We will often have situations where we have 30 or 40 parameters in a model, okay? And so now we are going to do the Bayes rule calculation, but we can't do it by hand anymore. So we're gonna use computational tools for this. In particular, we're gonna use Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. This is a topic that would require many hours of lectures, so I can't actually discuss this in detail, uh, but uh, I will provide you with some links uh, that you can look at so that you get a good idea of how uh, MCMC sampling works. And there's a wonderful chapter in this book, in the Ben Lambert book, which I've pro uh, provided a reference to here, which tells you uh, all the details about sampling. It's a wonderful chapter, you should read it. It's not very long, it's quite easy to follow, just as a standalone chapter, right? So you should read that.
right? So what we're going to do next is we're going to do Bayesian analysis, use Bayes rule, but we are no longer going to use analytical methods. We are going to do everything computationally, and the reason for that is that we're going to have much more complex models coming up that have so many parameters that it's simply intractable to try to do this by hand. And we won't have any conjugacy anymore either, because we'll have all kinds of priors for the different uh, parameters, and the posteriors will not reflect the, have the same form as the prior anymore, right? So we cannot actually rely on this conjugacy property by just doing the analysis. So the next topic will be computational base.